So we had just uh, demonstrated how you can go about uh, quantifying a spectrum um, like um, K309 using the quantification tool. Um, what we're going to do now is a, a, a complementary uh, uh, tool and very good one for uh, uh, learning uh, about uh, X-ray microanalysis. We're going to uh, simulate that spectrum. And uh, you might have noticed when we quantified the spectrum that we did, in fact, also uh, generate a simulation of that spectrum here, too. And so if I select that, um, you uh, uh, see that I now overlay this uh, blue spectrum, which is, in fact, a, a, a simulation of the spectrum. This was um, done automatically whenever you quantify a spectrum. And you can see that the uh, simulated spectrum, while not fitting perfectly, the silicon uh, uh, simulated is maybe uh, uh, Ten percent higher than the, uh, the than the than the measured. That in general, the agreement between the simulated and the unknown is fairly good. Um, we're going to talk some more about that, but th largely it's because uh, we've uh, set up our detectors uh, correctly. So this default detector is set up with certain pieces of information that allow us to actually simulate dose correct spectra. So by dose correct, I mean that if we input the correct uh, dose, the, uh, the product of the uh, probe current times the live time, that the simulated spectra will look both right in shape, but also in relative intensity. And uh, this is a, a, ver a very powerful thing to be able to do. So this, this simulation here was what we would call uh, an analytical spectrum simulation. So it used um, the uh, uh, algorithm used for the FIRO Z matrix correction, the, which is called XPP. It's the simplified model of Pushu and Pushuar uh, to actually perform the spectrum simulation. Um, we also can uh, simulate uh, 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 spectra um, using uh, a, another tool. The, this tool is available from the tool menu and it's called the uh, simulation alien. And the simulation alien gives you various different modes. We already discussed the top mode, this analytical model. This would be the same model that uh, was calculated here using the Pushu and Pichoir uh, analytical uh, FIRO Z curve. But it, we also have some uh, options based on what's called a Monte Carlo model. So a Monte Carlo model is a more time-consuming style of model because what it does is uh, simulate the trajectory of electrons in a material in a randomized fashion. Stoch stochastic model is what they call it. And then uh, simulate the spectrum based on that model. Now, Monte Carlos are great because they are very flexible in the sense that you can model large number of different geometries. With the analytical model, we can only model a bulk homogeneous material. With the Monte Carlo, we can bulk model lots of others. So in this example, I'm going to do a Monte Carlo model of a bulk homogeneous material, just like the material from which this spectrum was collected. I'm going to go ahead, and I'm going to just simulate the same spectrum again. So we're going to go with K309. So to do that, we're going to use the material editor to enter in um, the material. Uh, this material happens to already be in the database, so the uh, composition for it is already present in the database. So fortunately enough, we don't need to enter this information again, which makes it good for an example like this. Uh, another video will show you how to actually use the material editor. Uh, for Monte Carlo model, it's important that we have the uh, density of the material and since I don't know it for this glass, I'm going to put a guess of about 4 grams per centimeter squared. Um, this doesn't matter as much for bulk materials, but if you're modeling a uh, material with uh, a uh, shape and size, then the density is, uh, is pretty critical for getting the right um, output. So. K309, density of four, it's th this, these mass fractions, and so I select OK. All right, it's going to ask me if I want to update this information in the database because I've actually said that now this K309 has a density 
added this piece of information over here, the density, and I'm going to say, yes, I want to update the database. Next. OK, it's asking me again, what instrument and what detector and what calibration do I want to simulate this for? Well, we're using the same detector that we're using over here, the default detector, because that's the one this one is collected on. The beam energy, 15 kV, that's consistent with what the spectrum was collected at. Probe dose, this is the probe current times the live time and is entered in nanoamp seconds. Well, if we go down here, we can see that the probe current was uh, 3.93 and the live time, can we get to that too? The live time is over here is 59.339 seconds. If I use my handy calculator to, to get the product of that, I find it's 233.2 nanoamp seconds. So I'm going to enter in that, 233.2 nanoamp seconds. And we also get to select an incident angle. The incident angle is the tilt of the sample. And so and usually this is going to be zero, but you can enter in a number if you want to. Next. Now it asks us about some various other options. And uh, so the top option is whether we want to apply simulated count statistics to the output and how many output spectra we want. So each of the outputs will correspond to the same uh, Monte Carlo simulation, but we can add count statistics, different count statistics to each uh, spectrum. I'm just going to do apply the simulated count statistics, but I'm only going to generate one instance. And then it asks us how many electrons do we want to run. The default number is selected, um, and the default number gives you a, uh, a variance of about 1% on average in most of the uh, elements. And so it's typically the, the right one uh, to select unless you have a reason that you want additional precision. So that's to say, if I were to run this Monte Carlo multiple times, I would find that uh, there was about a 1% variation in the intensity of the peaks from run to run uh, if I select the default number of electron trajectories. Um, if I select four times that, I cut it by a factor of two. If I select 16, I cut that by a factor of four, so about down to a quarter percent. But they take much longer to run. Running the default number of electron trajectories means the simulation runs in about a minute, plus or minus. And then I can select uh, uh, X-ray generation modes. And uh, characteristics. This is one of the neat things about modeling, is that you can turn on and off physics. So I can select which modes I want to simulate. I'm going to select all of them here, which is characteristic primary. So these are the characteristic x-rays that we see in the peaks. Characteristic secondary are the uh, intensity in the peaks due to secondary fluorescence, Bremsstrong primary, and then Bremsstrong secondary. So. Um, uh, turn on and off physics can be useful for learning how these various different effects influence what we measure. Um, one of the options, too, uh, this is good for uh, learning about uh, the why you shouldn't do uh, quant and variable pressure. Um, I'm going to not enable that option for this example. Okay, I collect next, and it starts computing away. Um, as I said, uh, the model takes a while to run, and the reason for that is that um, the model is uh, actually tracking simulated trajectories of electrons through the material. And then at each time that the um, simulated electron scatters, uh, performs an elastic scatter off one of the atoms, uh, it also considers whether an X-ray was generated in that little last piece of, uh, of uh, trajectory and then tracks those simulated X-rays through the material back to the detector. So this process is uh, very time consuming as any individual electron will undergo 
uh, somewhere in the hundreds to, to a thousand uh, scattering events per trajectory. And then for a complicated material like uh, K309, there are uh, tens of different X-ray lines, uh, uh, many different barium lines, many different uh, iron lines, a handful of different silicon and oxygen lines. And, so, and aluminum lines, and so we have to track each of those, consider each of those types of X-ray independently. The net result is that uh, it takes um, a while uh, to uh, perform this calculation, and uh, so uh, you just you just have to be uh, patient. Uh, to put this in perspective, um, this Monte Carlo in DTSA2 is uh, a very efficient one and was optimized specifically for this kind of a problem. And so uh, it runs uh, probably an order of magnitude or more faster than uh, some of the uh, generic Monte Carlo problems, which can also uh, uh, study more complicated uh, medical physics and um, other uh, nuclear type um, problems. Uh, so it's a trade-off. Um, we make some optimizations, which uh, are simplifications that are permissible in this particular uh, environment. And uh, those optimizations allow us to uh, run these models in a, uh, in a reasonable amount of time. Um, certainly, uh, you can model a spectrum in less time than it takes to put the sample into, the into an instrument and collect the equivalent. So it's often uh, far more efficient to, uh, to do the modeling rather than to go down to the instrument. Plus, you get a lot of additional information out that you wouldn't. So the model's done. We ran 2,000 electron trajectories, and we click Finish. And it shows us it's added two additional spectra down here. We have the uh, emitted spectrum that looks like this. The emitted is. Uh, what we would see if we had essentially a perfect detector. The line widths are, uh, are very narrow. Um, the width of a particular channel, which in this case is 5 EV, and the, the, uh, the, the edges are very sharp. So uh, where there is an absorption edge in the material, the edge is very sharp because we are essentially modeling a, a perfect um, uh, detector. Probably more interesting is this one called Noisy uh, MC Simulation of a Bulk 309. And uh, we can compare that with uh, measured spectrum. And again, we see uh, really very uh, good agreement between the simulated and measured spectrum. You'll notice in the upper left-hand corner it says same scale, which is to say that uh, these are not being renormalized relative to each other. Um, this is a result of everything in the software being set up correctly and uh, shows us that we are capable of, of, of simulating spectra very reliably. So we got the, uh, the, the primary outputs are these two spectra. Okay, so we're going to go and look at a, uh, a, another output, which is um, the report. And again, uh, like in the case of the quantification, you get a very complete report of both what you did, the assumptions that went into the calculation, and then outputs. So simulation mode, Monte Carlo model of a bulk sample. Here is the definition of the uh, model uh, of the unknown that we're modeling, mass fractions, density, all that good information, some descriptors that tell you about what the conditions that we modeled were, so the probe dose, the beam energy, the detector, whether we did uh, uh, a variable pressure. And then it uh, has some various pieces of output. And these are the two spectra that we generated, uh, links to them again. So if we wanted to reload them, we can click on those. 
Um, it also uh, outputs a virtual reality markup language file. This is a, a, a three-dimensional representation of the trajectory of uh, the first uh, number of electrons in the simulation and is, uh, is a neat way to look at uh, uh, the, uh, the resulting output. Um, gets you some neat uh, looking uh, images or uh, models that you can actually rotate dynamically in a virtual reality markup um, application. Uh, some of them are available for free on the web. Okay, then we get some data out. We get uh, these are the, the uh, transition, the number of uh, x-rays generated per melistet radian, and then the number that are actually emitted. So the generated is the number that are actually produced in the sample. The emitted are the act number that actually emerge out of the sample. And then the ratio. So this is what fraction of those that are generated um, actually make it out. So about uh, uh, it turns out that 100% minus 28.7% of the oxygen is absorbed. So about 71.3% uh, uh, of the oxygen is, is actually never makes it out of the sample. So that's useful information. gives you an idea of what's going on in the sample. So we have the data for lots of different elements and lots of different lines in those elements. And we can see uh, get a lot of uh, uh, interesting information out of here. So this is the characteristic x-rays. So we also can mar model characteristic fluorescence. So this is secondary fluorescence uh, of the characteristic lines. And you can see that uh, you get uh, these numbers generated, emitted, and uh, the ratio gives you the how, what fraction were absorbed. So a lot of information in the table. Um, you can see that for the highest energy lines, the iron K lines, that there is no characteristic fluorescence because there's no characteristic line up in this region to fluoresce them. We also get a table with uh, continuum fluorescence, Bremsstrahlen fluorescence. And in fact, in the iron K case, you do in fact get some uh, fluorescence because there is Bremsstrahlen up in this region in here. So these, these x-rays in here can uh, be absorbed by the iron x-ray, uh, iron element, and then emit a iron K x-ray. Okay, so a lot of, lot of pieces of information. And then we do a comparison that compares the characteristic um, to the characteristic fluorescence. And we see what the, the, the characteristic fluorescence is a fairly small effect, but not, not negligible. It's uh, almost 2% in the case of the uh, calcium K lines. And uh, con comparing the characteristic to Bremsstrahlen fluorescence. So, OK. And, uh, and then uh, we get some uh, images. These images are what I call emission images, meaning that they uh, represent uh, the x-rays that are actually measured. So they are actually make it out of the sample. So um, you can see the point of entry of the beam. So the electron beam comes in at this point, And then this granularity you see in here is a result of the electron, randomized electron trajectories. The electron trajectories uh, are filled in this, this volume, and they generate x-rays, where the brightest the most intense uh, source of x-rays is right here in the center, and it diminishes out as we go both deeper in the sample and further away from the point of entry. We have a scale marker up here, so this is uh, this total from this side of the image to this side of the image is three and a half microns. From the top of the image to the bottom of the image is three and a half microns. This number down here represents the fraction of the most intense line. So aluminum Ks represent about 20% uh, of the most intense line. And if we look over here, we can see that that might be, might be reasonable. So OK, so let's, uh, there's a, a lot of different images. One of the more useful ones is the trajectory image. It gives you a, a perspective on this. Uh, this image is actually higher resolution than what you see here. 
and if you open it in a browser you can actually see the trajectories more more clearly but the trajectory so we see the uh, beam coming in at this point scattering about in here we also see the backscatter so these gray lines on top represent the backscatters um, okay we also get some information on fractional emission depths and volumes so for a, a specific uh, shell so the calcium K oxygen K aluminum K they have a certain ionization energy and uh, then uh, this column basically tells you that 50% of the uh, x-rays were generated within about 0.4 microns of the surface and 90% were generated within 0.77 microns of the surface and 99.9% were generated within 1.2 microns of the surface. So this tells you that essentially uh, the uh, depth of penetration and the generation of the x-rays was down to uh, 1.2 microns deep in the sample in for that particular line and it varies with lines the harder x-rays like the iron k it might be uh, a, a, a little less uh, for the slightly softer x-rays it's a little more and then we can also get the 50 percent generation volume so uh, the 50% of the calcium K x-rays were generated in the volume that's about 1.5 cubic microns and 99% of them, 99.9% .9 of them were generated with a volume that was 3.83 microns. So this gives you uh, some intuitive feel for uh, the uh, volume that from which the x-rays were generated. So a, a simulation is really a very powerful tool for uh, giving you intuition as to what's happening in a sample. And if you've set up your detector, it also uh, gives you a very good idea, if you go down to your instrument, what uh, the spectrum would look like from this particular material. So uh, it's a very uh, a powerful and useful tool, both for uh, educational purposes, but also as a practical tool for uh, planning measurements. So um, I hope you will uh, uh, find uh, that you uh, have good use for this tool.